Um, this is our last of four programs from News or Noise versus News. I always get that switched. Um, and we're just we're so thrilled you're here. Um, the great thing about um, these presentations, you can be here live. You can have, watch it live stream through the internet. And we also are archiving all these programs. To be captioned in Spanish and in English. So those are so, up usually a week after each event. So, um, so thank you for coming. With no further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our moderator, Amanda cook Vesperman, a history and political science instructor here at IBCC. We have David Giuliani from The Times. Uh, uh, Jenna Dooley from WNIJ and Jeff Dankert from the News Tribune. So thank you so much for coming and I hope you enjoy. Um, we will have an hour presentation with um, a 30 minute question and answer session after. So thank you. Welcome everyone and thank you again for coming out to IBCC for the Noise versus News program. I'm going to get started by asking questions. I did send uh, most of the questions ahead of time, but I'm going to start with a question that I didn't send them. You always got to have that gotcha moment in journalism, right? So um, I'll be asking questions and then the panelists can just sort of take turns or if somebody gets like two out there, then we'll, we'll sort of maybe go round robin or something. But the first question that I have for you, and I think it's a good one, is uh, where do you get your news from? I read the Chicago Tribune every single day, pretty comprehensively. I read the paper I work for, the Times, um, and then there's other publications like Time Magazine. Uh, I read that pretty thoroughly. I read Columbia Journal's Review. When it only comes out what four times or two times a year now. Uh, I read regional products. Uh, you know, uh, the News Tribune in La Salle. I read that, um, and I read lots of things online. But those, those are the main uh, publications I, I uh, listen to. I drive a lot, so I listen to the radio. I listen to your station, the public radio. And so I, listen, I, I, I pay attention to news all the time. Um, I get a lot from Twitter. I actually am not a Facebook user anymore. It was a little too much noise for me. We'll talk about later. I follow a lot of other journalists on Twitter. I follow Dave, and, and I kind of like it from the horse's mouth. So before he even publishes a story on his Twitter feed, I kind of know what's going into his story because he, he does a lot of live tweeting sometimes. Um, our listening area is regional, so we go uh, north to Janesville, uh, south to the area we're at right now. We go all the way just up near the Mississippi River and to the outskirts of Aurora. So there's a lot of local newspapers to follow. Uh, a lot of times the way I kind of do it is I read after the fact analysis sometimes, uh, Columbia Journalism Review, I like to read Pointer, is a great publication. It's kind of like if a story didn't get it right, it explains why. Uh, Pointer is a great resource. Neiman Lab is a great resource. Um, and honestly, as far as news, I have the guilty pleasure of I do celebrity gossip stuff all the time. So even though I'm not on <laughs> Facebook, I go to People.com and Entertainment Weekly and all those things. Uh, so I do a mix of, I would say, business and pleasure uh, is how I get my news. Yeah, I, I consume most of my news on the internet today. It used to be more print, but uh, our newsroom gets most of the regional newspapers, the local newspapers, the state newspapers, a few of the national newspapers, which I'll browse and print, but most of it's online. And I'll start with a, a news feed. Some news feed is usually my start. It might even be a Google news feed, but that will usually then spin off into some area maybe nationally or locally and uh, yeah so and I do consume some off of social media links uh. just as a follow-up question I noticed that none of you mentioned any uh, television news uh, any reason why um, I did I only mentioned I really kind of focused on print media and the you know media around here but I don't watch a lot sometimes on YouTube I'll watch some uh, CNN and Fox News uh, I'll go through the YouTube, the ones they suggest on Fox News and, and CNN. I like to do both of those. I do a little bit of MSNBC, but mainly f I like to get a kind of a feel for those two nationally, what they're saying, because you can get two different perspectives from them. I will at times sit down in the, you know, the 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock or 5 to 6 period and watch some TV news, local and national. And then some of the times I'm consuming national news online, which will come with a video. I might watch the video, which is usually a summary of the bigger story. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I would say probably by the time that I would watch, I'm on the air at 6 o'clock, so I'd watch it at 10. By then, I, I kind of am in, I'm done consuming for the day. <laughs> so it's just the day part of it. I, I, when I get home, I, I kind of will still keep following maybe my Twitter account, but just the sensory overload, I, it's not that I, I think uh, local TV and national TV, I think they do a lot of really good things, but I probably see it maybe in the clip the next day online. Okay. So um, I think it's fair to say that you are all mainstream news. So um, do, do people who read mainstream news, can they trust you? Or yes, consume it? I, think, I think relatively they can. And I, and I think I can speak for all of us in, in this environment that uh, mainstream journalism has an intention of delivering you a story with the facts, an accurate reflection of reality, with, uh, with the things you want to know about that story. I think every journalist here and, and elsewhere is trying to do that every day. I think the extra commitment is one of the things I've run into over the last couple of years as social media has gotten bigger is its scope and scale. Scope and scale always goes through my head. If I'm out in the field and, it's, and there's a tornado that's gone through, on social media, it's the biggest tornado that's ever happened of all time. And there's, there's dark cloud pictures, and you're like, oh my gosh, pray for the people there and there. Um, which is because it's happening now, and there's all these images, and it's, you know, and, and I think sometimes those are newsworthy events, and we're there and we're covering them, but in that moment, we lose scope and scale. We don't know how big is this event. How wide was this tornado? You know, we don't know, is it an EF2 yet? We don't know uh, fatalities yet, things like that. Um, and so when you have a severe weather thing, there's, there's Joplin, Missouri was one thing, and then there's what's happening now. And I look at um, trying to provide context at the time. With social media, when you're reporting, you lose some of that, um, but you're, you're consuming it, consuming it, consuming it. Um, sometimes that scope and scale doesn't come till later. Um, what I try to do is in mainstream is try to provide that as much as possible. I think one other example I would give is uh, a, a state budget. So let's say Illinois passes a state budget. Well, you need to know that there hasn't been a budget for 22 months. So um, yes, the news of the event is there is a state budget passed, but that's just one event happening. What is that immediate context that I can give you? Why should you care? Well, for 22 months, there hasn't been one. And so that's why I think in the mainstream, the difference is, yes, we want to get it out, and we want to be the, you know, it, it is nice to be the first person. You obviously want to be accurate. Um, but I think the mainstream takes one step back to give you maybe the tweet between the headline, an extra, an extra tweet or an extra paragraph to put it in context. I, I would hope. That's what I try to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Yes, I think uh, people can trust us. I mean, do we have bias? Yes, every human has bias. I mean, it, what we choose to put in our front page reflects biases of our life experiences. But what, we, what we're trained to do is recognize those biases and minimize them as much as possible. I mean, uh, you know, even in the words you choose, make sure, like, if you're going to say the state senator said, or should I say the state senator claimed? Well, claim. Yeah, that sounds kind of like uh, well, we're questioning what the state senator said. Said is always better, but so we do. We do gotta we gotta put our biases in check because we're humans. And every human has one just through life experiences. Uh, do we make mistakes? One hundred percent, absolutely. I, I'm testament to that. Uh, we do make mistakes, and one prominent mistake that happened in the White House at the beginning of Trump's term was a reporter wrote that there was no Martin Luther King bust in the uh, Oval Office, and a lot of people said that was fake news. No, that, that, that was not fake news. That was a mistake, uh, you know, definitely. No, 100% that was a mistake. There, uh, the Martin Luther King bust was still there. Uh, it wasn't a totally concocted story, which is what fake news is. So yes, we make mistakes, um, but we, we correct them when we do, or we should, and uh, we know how to minimize and keep in check our biases. Okay, yeah, so that, that okay. bus story, you can go online and find the backstory of how hard that reporter was working that story. He, was, he didn't just take somebody's comment and run. He was really working on that story. So there, somewhere online you can find the reporter's story of how that evolved. And uh, they were really working hard and they made, a, made an error and then worked really hard to correct it. So That's the difference between journalism and mainstream journalism and the people who are throwing out fake headlines. There's a, there's a, a vast difference. Oh, yeah. 
So can you tell us more about the specific things you do to ensure journalistic integrity? I, I can. Um, you, in our newsroom, and pretty much that reflects every newsroom, or, or most newsrooms, is that, you know, we're always questioning each other. Like, did you get this source? Did you get this side? Um, did you get the public documents to back that up? Uh, we do a lot of public records requests because uh, that's even better than just somebody saying something. So um, I don't know how many times I hear in our newsroom, um, you know, what about this person? Why don't you call this person? Um, I think that's good because um, maybe somebody will bring something to light that you didn't think of. So um, that's some of what we do at our, in our newsroom, and I'm sure that reflects other newsrooms. There's two basic there's two basic tests that I guess beginning journalists use that go through my head all the time, and it probably heard it. One of the things is if your mother says she loves you, check it out. And so that's <laughs> something that's always told. You know, even if your mom says she loves you, check it out. The other one is is the smell test. And so the smell test is if you've got a carton of milk in your refrigerator and it says it's going to expire in a week and you open it up and it's like, whoa, it's bad. Is it expired? Well, the date says it's not, but man, it doesn't smell good. The smell test is, it's not right. So if someone tells you something and, and you know they're a public official and they tell you something and it does not pass the smell test, either that's an error on their part or you need to back it up with something else. You don't just you know do it again because if, if your mother says you love her. Those are the two basic tests. Um, and we also, uh, I think as far as journalistic integrity, trust should not be assumed. Um, I trust myself and the people who I interact with a lot. So if, if it's the mayor, he interacts with me a lot probably. There's a trust, a built up trust. If I'm interacting with a member of the public for the first time, um, I need to explain what I'm, what I'm doing. There, I shouldn't assume that they trust me just because I'm with the media. I think about it in terms of the bedside manner. Um, if you're going to have, if you're going to get a dental appointment and you don't go very often, you'd sure like it if the dentist kind of explains to you, well, here's what's going to happen. Um, you know, again, if, if you need to pause and, and take, take a break or regather your thoughts. Um, and so I think that's a change I've done in the last year or two, is if I'm dealing with members of the public, I'm going and saying, they don't have to talk to me. Why, why should they have to talk to me? I need to go up to them and, and show them the value of me telling a story does nothing. If they open up to me, they can share that story with a much wider audience, um, a wider audience. And so that's why I think what the integrity comes is not assuming trust. Yeah, integrity covers a lot. I mean, it's, it's, it's balance and it's, it's everything, almost it captures everything we try to do. So, I mean, David mentioned bias. Everybody has a bias. All reporters have biases. I can remember uh, Jim Lehrer being asked, or his, his effort to remove his bias was so strong that he told people he didn't vote <laughs> and there was yeah. yeah that he just wouldn't go into the ballot box but then Sam Donaldson and he was an old news or uh, uh, TV journalist he made the point but Lehrer knows how he would have voted so it really doesn't <laughs> so really he's carrying around his bias so either way you're carrying around biases from your life yeah, and it's important you just set those aside, and you know when they're creeping in, and you remove them as best you can. Uh, or the public I, I think will call, well, they'll let you know about them. I mean, there's also checks right. and balances with the public, mm -hmm. um, and, and they will let you know if a story is leaning one way or the other, or if they perceive that it's leaning one way or the other. That's the and advantage I, of Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> engagement, extra engagement. Yeah. And I think with sources, you have to treat them in a way that I treat sources differently. The public. They have, you're right, they have no obligation. You folks have no obligation to tell me anything about you. Public officials, there's a greater, greater liability on them to say something or provide information. I'm just wondering, though, if we're sort of taking bias and we're making it to say, well, everybody has bias, which is true, I agree. Uh, and then saying, but we try to set that aside. But do you feel as if the public perceives your particular news outlets to be biased in one direction or the other? Because I can tell you what I hear is that the Times and the Trib have a conservative bias and that NPR has a liberal bias. So how do you respond to that? I can address that. Uh, our paper used to be called the Daily Republican, so no secrets there. A lot of papers around the country were, very par were partisan organs at one time. And, and you can see that names of newspapers around the country, including here. Um, uh, you know, we do get that uh, charge on, you know, that we get the charge more often probably conservative than liberal because of that history. 
and also, uh, you know, people think the owner is conservative in, in that kind of uh, thing. Um, you know, I've never met the I've never met the owner of our our company. It's, it's only a few newspapers, but um, that doesn't really play a role in the newsroom. I mean, professional journalists. Our role is not to wonder what the owner is thinking or what the owner's biases is, but for we have to cover a story and call it like it is. So, uh, yeah, we get the charge, and, and I think I think it's fair for the public to assess whether we're conservative or liberal. I think we need to be aware of what people are thinking, and uh, like I said, Facebook is good for that because <laughs> people will tell you if they think they have a, you have a bias in your story, they will tell you on Facebook, and so. Um, that's kind of the history of our organization and why we get that charge. Yeah, um, people are going to think what they're going to think and they're going to go to the sources uh, that they think. Uh, I mean, every, you, you ask what we follow, everyone follows their own sources. Um, I would say as far as a bias, I, I don't wake up in the morning saying how can I further this agenda. I'm, I'm one person at the local level. Um, anytime you have an organized group of people, someone's going to try to attribute a trend to them. Um, but at the same time, I, the people I interact with as a reporter, I, I kind of go back to we're each a different individual and we are trying to better the, ci the civic good and there are going to be some bad actors. And I, I believe there's enough checks and balances in the mainstream media to weed those those out. Yeah, I think I think media institutions, if you look at the ownership, they're conservative. And I think studies have shown that the ownership of different media outlets are conservative, whereas the reporters might be liberal if you were to ask them. But uh, we, you know, our paper gets accused of being conservative and liberal. <laughs> yeah, we get it both ways, and it depends on. It depends on what story the, the person's reading that day. If you did a study, you'd want to look at, I mean, studies tell you the true picture, and those are hard to get at sometimes. But, um, I think know, I, I, yeah. it's, it's just, yeah, I can tell you that you don't, if you guys could see what goes on on this side of the wall, you might be a little surprised. I guess this, this is really, this kind of forum is to break through that. You don't, you don't see any agenda making. You don't see a secret cabal. I got that accusation again today. Oh, well, we that, all that, that one. Oh, you, you guys are meeting and, you know, playing favorites to politics, and it just doesn't work that way. But you're talking about ownership. <clears throat> I, you know, with public radio, if you don't know the funding structure, we receive a, a good portion of our funding structure directly from listeners and so we do those fund drives those pledge drives people answering the phones you know you see that on public TV and, and public radio so we are accountable to the public and we do hear them when people people give their dollars when they feel like we're fair and balanced and we get those in the comments um, that we don't have we're not a commercial radio station so if there's an election a lot of commercial stations they get money to for candidates we don't get that revenue source um, we do our license is held by Northern Illinois University so we do receive um, some Arts Council funding and some funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting sometimes you'll hear that you'll say you know the government wants to kill Big Bird um, because yeah there, there is um, stations across the country um, do receive funding from different sources uh, the big bulk of what we get does come from listeners. Um, our license is held by a university, which is the case for a lot of public radio universities, uh, but we have a firewall between our newsroom and any administration at the university. Um, so we are not told, we're not a mouthpiece for the university. If we have to report on a hiring or a firing, um, there's no one telling us we can or can't report on that. Sometimes we will do a disclaimer if it's a story that uh, very much involves the university we might say at the end uh, the station is owned by and licensed to the university just to have that added level of transparency but um, I certainly have never ever had a university administrator or president come to my office and say how dare you write that story or why were you looking into those numbers or you know that report didn't make us look very good can you just maybe you know not put that I, I personally have never had that and I've worked within two university systems in the state of Illinois. One other thing I would add is we do receive some corporate support. Um, so you ever hear a support for programming comes from Dr. So-and-so or Dr. So-and-so. Every once in a while there might be a coincidence where maybe a theater group has purchased underwriting and our news team was going to do a story about that. So maybe we were going to do, our, our arts reporter was going to say, hey, well this looks like an interesting uh, play they're doing where I'm going to go to a rehearsal, I'm going to interview people. Um, 
but those are separate decisions. There's never an underwriting person saying, hey, you know, they bought some time. Can you do a story on it? It's only if there's a news judgment decision, and then if we find out that they're an underwriter, then we have a disclaimer at the end to say, um, you know, you just heard this story. This entity is an underwriter of the station. Again, there's transparency, but to be clear, uh, we're never told do this story because this entity has paid the station. I think there's been a lot of talk about being fair and balanced uh, and not just from Fox News. Uh, and I think part of what's going on is that there's a real push for balanced to mean fair. And as a result, we've ended up with a lot of false equivalencies. Uh, how do you perceive that difference between fair and balanced? Well, I wrote a story about climate change. Uh, what was it about? I think it was last fall. And I felt no obligation to find somebody who didn't believe it. Uh, I just wrote about, I talked to the state climatologists and presented how it was going to affect Illinois. I think that's, I think that's what you're trying to get at. Mm -hmm. I could have went out and found somebody to dispute what the state climatologist was saying, what the evidence said. I don't think that serves the reader very well. Why not? Because it would just confuse them. Mm -hmm. If they believe that there's some doubt that scientists for 20, 30 years have been tracking this. I mean, there's plenty of arguments within the scientific community about climate change. You know, I think those can be, those can be reported on. But that brings up somebody, one of the, I think the professor last week was trying to remember the uh, author's name who's written the book, The Death of Expertise. It was Tom Nichols. He's making the rounds now. Uh, and I haven't bought the book, but I've read some of his ex excerpts and he's, he's on a speaking tour and you can find him online talking about this. And experts are not, they're, they're not trusted, you know, like they used to be. People who have spent time studying this, uh, studying that or this, and, you know, one person on, on a blog can challenge them. Well, fair and balanced, they are separate things. If there's, if there's a protest down at the Capitol and 300 people come and they've got signs saying, down with cursive, or something like that, which is actually a real thing. That down with cursive, okay? My, my son's behind you. He's got, okay, let's say there's, there's 300 protesters in the rotunda and they've got all these signs and there's one person in the corner saying, keep cursive alive. Okay, so <laughs> balance would be me, the reporter, talking to one of the protesters and that one supporter. But is that fair? That doesn't put the context. It goes back to that scope and scale. My job as a reporter to say, okay, I've presented both sides, but to be clear, there were hundreds of opponents to cursive today at the Capitol, and so I've, I've created a, I'm making it fair to, to give the audience a visual of what really happened because the, 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 the opponents might have been mobilized. They're there because yeah. they're a common cause. Yeah. What I can't see in my audience is who, how many people really are for and against. I can't do a, a test of that. So that's why it is important for an issue like that to present both sides, but also give context of just um, what is the, the difference in the playing field in that, that particular event I'm covering. Yeah, I think subjective topics like that, like you know, should we be writing cursive or should we be, should we, the death penalty? Uh, we're still struggling with the, the abortion issue. I think there's no clear, you know, there's not a scientific study that said, yep, we should be, we should be aborting babies or a scientific study that said, no, we shouldn't. It's really, a, it's really our social opinion. We're still struggling with that. I think in that case, you get both sides more than you would, uh, say, on a story on evolution, which is a done deal, has been for, 50 years. Unless you're covering the anti-evolution group, then you have to get their voice. Yeah. So we were talking before, and of course this is about noise versus news, so what is fake news? How do you define it? I define it as uh, concocted stories. I mean, I'll give you just one example. It's not, you know, news, I mean, when I was first asked to this forum, this was I think around February, maybe January, and this whole idea of fake news being news you don't like or just makes you angry, uh, I think there's a certain president who, who reacts to things, fake news, fake news. <laughs> fake news is not news you don't like, or even news that might be inaccurate, but maybe somebody tried to be accurate, but they were off, or news that's biased, maybe. It's really <coughs> just fully concocted stories. I'll give you one example. Um, last year, there's a report that First Lady uh, Michelle Obama's mother will receive a $160,000 annual government pension. Um, actually, somebody fa uh, put this on, one of my Facebook friends put this on there and said, this is outrageous. How, does anybody support this? I said, no, I wouldn't support it, but it's not true. 
um, she's not receiving a pension. She, the mother-in-law for uh, you know the president's mother-in-law. That's that's crazy, and it it, it it just does not, just not true. And you know, for the other side, uh, there was a story making the rounds on the internet. Uh, ben Carson uh, argues his experience separating twins and denying evolution is exactly what qualifies me to serve as uh, HUD head. He's the head of the HUD, you know, Housing and Urban Development. You know, that was untrue, but people who are on that, so who don't like Carson, don't like Trump, they're going to, oh, I'm going to put that in Facebook. They're, they're, they're weak, and they put that on. And the other thing, oh, well, Obama's mother-in-law is going to be taking all this money from the government. You know, this got to be true. That's fake news. They're totally concocted stories. What, what Trump is refer, refers to as tr fake news is not fake news. Yeah, I think, I think there's fake news and there's fabricated news. And I was at a gathering of news broadcasters this weekend down at the University of Illinois, and a professor there said, stop using fake news. It only legitimizes it. I think the issue with a, a blanket term like fake news is it offers no specificity of what the issue is, and it offers no solution on how you can solve it. So fabricated news is something someone made out of thin air that they somehow want to monetize or get their 15 minutes of fame. With fake news, it's, it's just an effort to provide a blanket term. Um, I think what would be more helpful instead of using fake news would be to say, uh, yeah, that's inaccurate, that's, that was plagiarism, that was fabrication, um, that was misleading, that was uh, taken out of context. Then um, I think the good actors, the good reporters, can make a correction. Uh, otherwise, fake news will never be it'll be fake news into perpetuity. It'll, there's no solution with that term. Yeah, I know some of the other episodes of this series, you, you've had people talk about fake news, but in essence, it's just news that's completely made up whole cloth, uh, maybe with a grabbed photo, and uh, it, it's not, none of it's true, and the whole, in, it, it comes down to intention. The intention wasn't to be informative or to be true, it, the intention was to make money off of clicks on the internet and to uh, deceive. So that's what I meant when I said there's a wide gap. All the rest of journalism that's trying to do a good job, they'll make mistakes, but it doesn't come close to the intention. And, and I, yeah, here, here, to give you an idea of how deep the fake news generators think, uh, one of them was coming out of the Republic of Georgia, the fake news maker, and they talked to him. And here's what he said. My audience likes Trump. And this is a direct quote. My audience likes Trump. I don't want to write bad things about Trump. If I write fake stories about Trump, I lose my audience. That's as deep as it goes. It's the motivation. Yeah. It's the motivation to dupe the public or to sway the public. And I don't think, as we've talked, that's not my motivation at the beginning of the day. <laughs> the, the motivation is to inform the public to the best of my ability not with my own knowledge, but bringing together people who can shed light on that and be right. the facilitator of that information. Right, right. And the solution is, if you see something like that on Facebook, even if you're like, oh, I believe that, that's, that's, that's horrible that Obama is doing that or Trump is doing that, just take the headline, put it in Google, and then usually Snopes will come up and they'll say this is you know, fake news or something else. If you don't see it in any of their mainstream outlets, I know we'd love to hate mainstream media, oh, the mainstream media, they're all corporate owned, but you know what? We like being competitive. And we like booking stories out there that are crazy. Like if Obama's um, mother-in-law was really getting a pension, the mainstream media would be all over that. That would be that would be a huge story. Yeah. So if you if just put it in Google, and if you don't see if you see Snopes saying it's fake news, or you don't see other major outlets uh, saying it's uh, you know having a story about it, you've been duped. Well, you haven't been duped yet, but you you won't don't post it on Facebook. Yeah, my favorite headline was Pope Francis endorses Trump, but then I. <laughs> I could have written down a whole list of them, but from this last episode. Here's another headline. True. Pope has died 22 times in five years. Now, here's the, here's the little twist. What year was that? 1903 in the United States. What newspaper? The Washington Post. The Pope has died 22 times in five years. That was, now we're going back into yellow journalism days. So I wonder, though, if everything is really that clear-cut, if it's just fake news and mainstream news that you can trust. Where would you put Breitbart on that spectrum? spectrum? Um, well, I don't, know, I don't really, I mean, I would, he obviously, I mean, that outlet obviously has a clear bias. 
to support one side of the spectrum. And why, 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 why are we going national on this? Uh, why don't we just go to the local Illinois Valley Times? I mean, that's a paper. I mean, we don't need to go national. Let's go right here local. That, that paper is circling in this area and still does occasionally. And there's a site, and the writers are from out of the, out of the area, and they have one purpose is to support Republican candidates. And it presents itself as a, as a newspaper that's like mainstream media. That's, they say they hate mainstream media, those folks, but then they want to present themselves as such. I wouldn't mind if they said this is the Republican Party or the conservative opinion, but they don't really do that. Um, David, it's good you bring that yeah. up. Do you guys know what he's talking about? Have you seen this Illinois Valley Times newspaper? Yeah, it's, I, do they circulate? They circulate a print edition as well. They did they? a month or two ago. It was landing in mailboxes. Yeah. Show me a copy. Yeah. And but I haven't seen it since then. But apparently every once in a while. But they still have that online site. Right. Yeah. It was put out by Liberty Principles, a, a uh, political action committee, yeah. uh, by a man named Dan Proft, who headed that organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then somehow it slid into a for-profit company, but we never figure out how the assets are transferred. And boy, we did we did stories on it. And I think your paper did stories yeah. on it. Um, so there, that paper circulates, and that's kind of an example of Breitbart News. Also, kind of presents itself. Well, I think Breitbart News is a little bit more forthright about what agenda they have. But this Illinois Valley Times presents itself as a mainstream publication, but it's a mainstream publication that only seems to promote one side. And they kind of sprinkle in some news briefs, local press releases, to kind of give them a legitimacy, too. You'll see something about the library, or, right. and, then, and then some other story. Edgar County Watchdog's uh, website. That was the one I was thinking yeah, of. Yeah, they're, they're kind of out there. I think Breitbart is, I'd call them a biased. But boy, there's been some headlines that are just kooky. Don't even make me want to read the story, you know. So I don't know where they fall. Okay. Um, let's move on to talking about um, where you think the noise is coming from. And, and when I ask that question, it's sort of more like, why, why now? Why, why are we suddenly seeing such a surge in this noise, if you will? Well, I think part of it's social media has amplified it just to a degree we've never seen before if you think about the 1903 headline that would have had to have been read you'd have to pick it up and then talk to somebody about it that hits the internet and it's just spreads like wildfire so I think that's part of the noise and another part of it is we live in a country with free speech you know so while we try to tamp down the fake news and the false claims, we don't want to tamp down free speech. So in a country with free speech, it's noisy. And noise has a negative connotation, obviously, that's kind of like a fly you want to swat away or it's negative. You know, a couple of years ago, the big thing was engagement. You know, I know public radio stations are increasingly hiring engagement professionals to how do you work with your audience? How do you find out what's in the pulse of the, how do you get in touch with what people are really interested in? Engagement has a positive connotation. And so when I think about the noise, I think about, well, we've always wanted this. We've wanted a more direct engagement with our audience and now we're getting it. Um, the issue, I think, when it becomes noise is the motivation behind it. Um, if someone hears a story and it mobilizes them to action, cool. Um, but when you talk about the noise, it's, it's someone who, is either perpetuating fake news or, you know, per, I, again, I hate using fake news, perpetuating a fabricated story um, and is adding to, to that. Um, but I'm, I'm with, with you, my job isn't to police that. I believe in the First Amendment. Um, if it becomes threatening, then that's an issue. I, you know, that needs to be. But my job as a reporter is, is not to silence anybody. Um, but I think you've got noise and you've got an in, You've got noise and you've got engagement, and sometimes it can be kind of gray on which one's which. How about infotainment? How does uh, John Stewart, um, um, it's not the John I wanted, I can never remember John that. John Oliver. John Oliver, thank you. How does John Oliver, uh, does, does that kind of um, take on the news make your job easier, harder? It makes it more digestible. I mean, I certainly think it's, I enjoy watching it. I, I learn something from it. Also, the big thing is what we talked about. They don't purport to be something that they're not. And I think that's, that's, there's a transparency in that. And so there is information. Um, there's, there's an entertainment value to it. 
Um, but they don't, they're not pretending to be journalists either. It was infotainment. That came, that's like 20 years ago when they started using that term. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Stewart cracked through that whole thing, didn't he? I mean, I think he was the first person to say fake news were the fake news. And then he got on, uh, I think it was CNN's Crossfire and lambasted them. Oh, I love watching that clip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, lambasted them for getting two talking heads with opposite ideas and going at each other for a half hour hard, hot and heavy. And hurting America, I think is how he put it. Yeah, yeah. But yet he, but then because he's not real, he can make all these allegations, but he won't hold himself to say, well, I'm fake news, and he'll kind of retreat from that. Well, I think what he said was that I'm, I'm a comedian. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. that's my job is to entertain. It's not really necessarily to inform, although that might happen, you know, sort of along the way. Yeah. If it, if it, I think if it mobilizes curiosity and gets people to take an issue, I think there was one, John Oliver, one of his first big ones was about the Telecommunication Act or something, or FCC or something like that. It was enough of a spark and a nugget that then you can go to legitimate sources, but you wouldn't have even thought to Google that before. So I think that they can be used as a spark. I think Stewart also would, he'd take something like somebody's record of making a claim. He loved hypocrisy, right? So they said this, let's go into the archives. And he could do, his team did that well, where he'd show a politician saying something, and then he'd go back five years and prop that up and show him, you know, show him saying this. And when we do that in our publications, you know, if a politician says one thing, and then we've done that with uh, our congressman lately, if the congressman says one thing when he was running, and then he says something later, yeah, it should be reported. I mean, um, let the people know how, the congressman is is operating. I mean, you know, of course, you could have done that with Abraham Lincoln too. Uh, he was uh, not an abolitionist when he ran for president. One of one, if he was. So, but yeah, we they do that in comedy. We do that in the newspaper too. What do you do when you get it wrong to make it right? Uh, because I think one of the criticisms that people levy is that when the newspaper runs or the television runs uh, a story that they got wrong, intentionally or unintentionally. It's front page, it's out there. But well, when they when they find out that it's wrong, do you really feel like the news industry is doing enough to correct that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think if you find out new information, I, that happened to me this last year. We did a story on uh, Frank Martino's pension, and we actually went to the pension system and said, you know, with him and his auditor general after a year, how much will he get? Because there's already stuff from conservative websites about how much he was going to get. I had an email and they said exactly, the guy who was responsible for it said exactly what he was going to get. It was an email, it was a statement, this is exactly what he's going to get after a year of bump and pension. We ran, that probably ran, we did the first story and we'd run a number of stories, that same information. Well, the next, about eight months later, we find out that, uh, I forgot where I heard it from, but that the number they gave was wrong. Uh, and so I called the pension system and the guy said, yeah, you know, we were wrong. Uh, he says, that is my fault. We, I, there was one nuance, and it wasn't uh, that much, uh, it wasn't that much higher. Uh, as they said, I think it was, was 55,000 higher. And so we did another story saying, well, this is the new information we have. Um, and, and you should do that with a lot of things. I mean, sometimes, you know, stories have an evolution. So you talk to the two sources. Maybe you can get a hold of a third source, but it was a big story, and you thought you got all the sources you need, but another source comes later. Well, heck yeah, I mean, if that source is critical to the story, you should do another story. You should say it's, it's over with. And um, with respect to broadcast, we, have, uh, we are respectful of the day part when people hear it. So if there was an issue that happened during the 4 o'clock news, um, obviously we would, we would do the correction in the next logical break. If, if I read the 4 o'clock news, oh, shoot, that's not the person's name. Do a correction after that. And then we could give respect to uh, the next day at that time, at 4 o'clock, because that's when that, that particular audience, we have high turnover when people listen. Um, an example I can think of this week, there was a, a race up in Rockford. It was a write-in school board candidate race, and it ended up being a tie. And so in Illinois, you have to do uh, either flip a coin or do highest card to determine the tie. So there was a highest card, and we had a reporter who was up there and was feeding back pictures and calling in so that I could get it onto the newscast. Um, and she sent me a picture, she's like, oh, the cards are out. And there was a, there was a queen of clubs and a I don't, four of hearts or something like that. 
And so I started writing it. I'm like, oh shoot, you know, I'm going on any minute. Okay, uh, so and so wins it with the Queen of Spades. And right before I went on, I read it out loud, and it's like, oh shoot, um, it was the Queen of Clubs. I'm like staring at this card, and you know, you're just you're under deadline and stuff like that. So obviously, it wasn't intentional. Um, but that particular one, if I would have gone on air and said that, then you do the correction. If you've got a web post, then you need to do a correction. If people have retweeted that that Twitter that has the the inaccuracy in that. That's the difference now, I think, is if, if I make a mistake on air, it doesn't just go away, poof, oh, psh, no, we, no, we can find a paper trail on it. We've got tweets, we've got Facebook, Facebook posts, and we've got web posts that are all in their little tentacles going out that we then have to try to call back. And so um, the way we do it is own up to the mistake, be considerate of the day part, and also be immediate with the clarification or, correct, or straight up correction. Yeah, we write a correction as soon as we discover it. And uh, uh, you just write it, write the correction, and publish it in the paper. If the correction is such that it's such a prominent thing, it might demand a story, a follow-up story, correcting the previous story, and making it prominent enough in the paper that it people can see it. You know, if you may, if you misspell a name or that the Queen of Hearts thing or uh, the dog's name was. Uh, Timmy instead of Johnny. It's just a standard <laughs> correction, right? It, not a lot of weight there. To a reporter, I will tell you that nothing ruins our day more. And it, right. can, go, it can be the Queen of Hearts thing that can ruin your day. Right. Yeah. That's all it takes. Yeah. You can get a good dog's name wrong, that'll ruin my day. Yeah, that's true. And that's all it takes. And that, uh, it, it can be the smallest little thing. Right. The big ones really, you know, I ruin your month. But but, uh, We're sensitive people. Right. <laughs> we don't want to get anything wrong. We go to great pains not to. I mean, yeah. editing a story, really, if you your first draft and you're going through it, and I think these guys can relate to this, the, 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 the thing you're doing is taking out the things that you're not sure about. If or you make a call to make, make sure you know it and you can put it in there. Yeah, I, I, I was doing a story and I looked over it ah, so many times, so many times, and I was just like, oh, it was a big one that was going to fire off the next morning, and I just couldn't, I was like, couldn't sleep, and I'm like, there's got to be something, because it was a really long one, and turns out that the, it was, the name of the theater was T-H-E-A-T-R-E, -E, and of course I spell it T-H-E-R-T-E-R, -E -E so the next morning I get an email that it was, I was like, oh you know you can try to cross every T and dot every dot I and get the, the facts that are like what you think like are really the facts and then something like that will come in and then while it's correct that it's incorrect yeah it's right. just like oh, yeah I call it that's... stepping into mud puddles the world sets up yeah. mud puddles for us to step in every that's day the only gets you. and I are blind spots you're, you're, you've oh, got, you see your and you stuff. don't see the thing over your yeah. shoulder and it'll yeah, one yeah. newspaper I, I was at we um, I actually had to control it uh, front page, so I started playing the corrections on the front, lower front page. So that was kind of a neat idea, just to kind of this full disclosure, you know, we made this mistake. One mistake I made in a headline once was a nursing home won an award, and I put the other nurse, the nursing home names were similar, and I put the other nursing home in town instead of the one that actually won the award. And somebody called me up saying, you did that because that's the wealthier news, uh, <laughs> wealthier nursing home, and you were trying to make the poor nursing home, you didn't want to give them any credit. I said, well, I, I, but they, people sometimes accuse you of bias when you make a mistake. It's like, no, I don't want to make a mistake like that. <clears throat> no way would I do that. So, but people had in their mind that you, you made a mistake on purpose. So you may have to speculate a little bit because I know that all of you are not engaged in, in television news and you don't seem to consume it a lot, but I think a lot of Americans do. And I think there's a lot of pressure put on these 24-hour news stations, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, etc., to, to fill time and to get stories out there really, really quickly. And I'm wondering if you can sort of talk about how you feel that they do in getting it right. Because we hear a lot of information, I think Fox News probably gets hammered the most that you know, a certain percentage of everything they say every day is wrong. Um, I'm just wondering what your take on that is. Is it different? Well, they fill it with a lot of analysis. I think you've got the headline, you've got the who, what, when, where, why, and how, and that'll take you about 30 seconds. The rest is you, you pass, and again, I, this is as a consumer, not as someone who's worked in TV news. So this is just my own um, observation is the <coughs> rest of the pie, if, if the top of the hour is here's what we know, 
The rest is here's what we don't know and here's what we're going to offer analysis. And I think there is a value to analysis. And I think NPR does a lot of analysis, whether it's um, what we call reporter two ways, where you talk to another reporter who's reporting on that. I've, I've done that with Dave, um, where I'm not going to try to be the expert on an issue he's researched for three months um, in a day. So if he comes out with a big story, I, yeah, uh, the nature is he is the expert on that source. Um, and he's the best person to communicate that to the to the community. Um, I think you need to use that in small doses. You can't use it every time because then we just become the aggregation channel. Um, but when it comes to TV, I think you have to consider how much of their pie is the facts and what is known versus what is speculation and anali analyzing what is not known. And that could fill a big portion of the hour. I think the big networks, they pay a price when they make a mistake. They're trying just as hard as others not to make them. I don't know how well they police themselves on every little mistake. I, I just don't have a feel for that. I watched Anderson Cooper try to tell somebody who they were accusing. It was, it was Kellyanne Conway on his program. And it was the dossier coming out of, what was that? It was that British spy, and he released a dossier about Trump and something. And, and CNN reported that the dossier was being reviewed by the White House, and Kellyanne Conway was telling Anderson Cooper, you guys ran with the dossier story. Some other outlet had gotten it wrong, saying that it, I don't know what their error was, saying it contained truths or uh, something in it was correct, and all CNN was doing was saying the dossier was now handed in as a brief to the White House staff or something. And she, he was trying really hard to make the distinction the little nuance there, but uh, he was on the hot seat because somebody else had gotten it wrong. And there's a lot of cooks at that level. Um, from story start to finish, I have a lot of control over my story. And there's an editor, clearly editor, but from story visioning to on air, there's two or three people that touch that story. When you get to the bigger and bigger levels, I mean, there's more editing levels and there's more people that are changing one word or changing one word here. Um, so I don't know if it's like the telephone game where by the end it, it, you change it to such a degree that then maybe it becomes misleading. But certainly at the local level, that's why I like working in the market size that I work because I have a lot of control. But at the end of the day, if there's a mistake, then it's it's right. me. It's yeah. me. There is a lot of pressure in 2012 when the Obamacare decision uh, the, was made by the Supreme Court. Um, CNN, I believe CNN and Fox got it wrong immediately after they said uh, it, it ruled against Obamacare because mm -hmm. the first argument that it made was they did rule against it, but then the next argument they said, yeah, they were right, so Obamacare was largely approved, but they were on the air right at that moment, so they said Obamacare um, is gone because of the Supreme Court. They were wrong, and that's the pressure of being on at the moment. I have a little bit more luxury because I, I write for a newspaper and I'm online, so I can think a few for a few minutes rather than being right there on, <laughs> on live. I think social media also, for me, is a useful tool to um, take some of that pressure off of having the scoop. So if I have a big headline that something or other has happened, I can tweet what I do know, and then it's like, okay, I'm on the board. You know, It's out there that we have it, and then that our listeners know we're actively working on it, but then we can slow down and get it. it were, so I think before it's like the scoop would be you'd have the full thing and then you would hit publish. Now we can get a nugget out there, our audience knows we're on top of it, and then take the time to, to get it. So, um, and, and we're not in the business of being first. I'm, I'm not in a super, super competitive market either. Um, so if, if something big happens and then a newsmaker does something, there's one, two, or three reporters. There's not 20 trying to be the first on it. Yeah, I've, you know, I've been in newspapers long enough so that I can remember the, working for a print newspaper without a web. So there you had, it was 24 hour year daily. That was up in Minnesota. Now we're writing for the print edition, but we're also writing for the web. And so you can write, you're, you can do updates on the web with smaller nuggets uh, in a way that you wouldn't put in the newspaper. So that final story that goes in the next day will be a longer version with, with more detail. But at least we can, like you said, tweet Facebook and pops up on, up on the web to let people know. And being first is a little bit overrated. Hmm. I mean, people don't go to parties and say, oh, that organization got that story before they did. People don't talk like that, but we talk like that in our industry. So being first, well, 
it's somewhat important to give news quickly to, to readers or viewers. It's not the most important thing. Well, I think about the 2000 election. Fox News decided to call that election for George Bush when nobody else was calling it. Everybody turned into Fox News to watch that story. And that certainly put pressure on the other stations to want to try to call that election, too. Um, speaking of elections, do you think the media, just in general, got the 2016 election right? Not, not the prediction, but the way in which they covered it? I don't know. It, it would have been so hard to cover. I mean, everything that was being said, you have to cover what the candidates are saying, right? And, if, and even post-election, the media has been criticized for talking about what Trump tweets. <laughs> but this is the president's tweets. You have, to, you have to do a story about some of these tweets, you know. So I, I don't know. That's a tough one, you know, because I think the challenge was they were reporting on Hillary's emails and reporting on Trump's uh, wild, day-to-day, -day misdirected quotes, you know. I, I don't know. We have the luxury, um, because we're part of a larger network and we're a member station, we do the local side of it. So um, there's certain trends that are going to be different in terms of how a particular candidate is doing within our listening area. And that's not biased. It's, it's here's the election numbers and here's how many people voted. That might be different than other states. So, you know, Illinois typically we had a pretty good idea how Illinois was going to vote and in our region historically from how they voted. Um, the advantage we have is we pipe into NPR which has reporters on each campaign. So our listeners get the benefit of hearing from reporters that are on the ground with those campaigns. That takes the pressure off of me having to explain uh, what's happening nationally. My job is just to get a pulse of what's happening within, within the own listening area, and that's something a little easier to control. Um, so when you say, you know, as you look back at the election coverage, well, there was a lot that did was incorrectly polled, um, if you followed the polls, but that was done at a national level. And, and yes, it was our overall reputation as, as people listen, because they, when they listen to the radio, they don't necessarily care if it's me doing local or the morning person. They're just hearing a voice come out of it. Um, but what I could control um, is, is continuing to talk to the people uh, literally that, that are living in, in our area that we serve. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are criticizing the media for like getting it wrong, like they, everybody said Hillary would win, and the polls said that. But, and then they said, you know, we in the media should have gone to Wisconsin, Ohio more and got the polls there. But if you look at the statements from Trump and you look at the statements even from organizations that are allied to Trump, NRA, the large expectation was that Hillary was going was gonna to win. I mean, even Trump was sounding like Hillary was going to win. So to say that the media is alone on that is is unfair criticism in my mind. Yeah, I think I was thinking more than just did they get it right in predicting the outcome of the election, but in the coverage of the election, I think there was a lot of questions about false equivalencies and in, in, in that election. So I was sort of thinking along those lines. Yeah, yeah, and I think, yeah, people were, felt the media, and I'm talking about the national media right. here, the national media felt an obligation to, re to report on the Hillary emails. Uh, and they bounced between that and crazy things Trump said. Ba that was basically the coverage. That was, and, and where were the issues? You, you, we watched debates and issues would surface, you know, substantive issues, but they would just get tidal waved, washed away from within 12 hours or 24 hours from uh, the latest on the email scandal, the WikiLeaks, and something Trump said. If Trump, if Trump had a strategy, I mean, I don't even, I don't know if it was intentional, but boy, he, he kept the ball moving. You, you couldn't really focus. Well, and I think that's part of, you know, the question continuing today: Are they still playing the, me the media? Uh, because it does seem as that there's a there's a lot of stories, a lot of talk about Russia, a lot of talk about the uh, the gaffes by Sean Spicer and Kellyanne Conway. Um, and, and that seems to be grabbing so much of the headlines as opposed to the individual pieces of legislation, the individual uh, executive orders that Trump is putting out that have real consequences for real people, the environment. Uh, are, 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 they, are they still playing the media? Well, there's the insatiable appetite we have now through social media. And so you're going to, you, they're seeing where there is uh, demand, there's going to be supply. And what we've talked about today is 
the difference between the supply and demand, we've got such a high demand and there's not a huge supply of people doing what we do for for different reasons, that difference and gap I think is going to be filled with some of that fake news and get fabricated news or news that for people who want to get into that space because they know people are hungry for these headlines or these angles or who uh, who wore what at the inauguration or whatever, um, the demand is there and there's only so many people to, to supply it. So I think some people, some opportunists see this as a, as a, as a space that they want to play in. And she, she's right. I mean, like uh, even in our newspapers, you know, we're weakened, uh, there's no secret there, um, that we're weakened right now, uh, struggling. And um, there are groups out there that are producing content, like the Illinois News Network is an arm of the Illinois Policy Institute, and they produce stories that um, are relatively good, but they have a point of view uh, for conservatives, and there have been a number of papers around the state that have taken those stories. Uh, in fact, maybe we did it one time. I have no idea, but I, I don't think our paper did. But but a lot of papers have. And the problem with that is is that first off, if you do run it, you should say who the organization is because Illinois News Network sounds really great, but it, it's uh, it's it's not that. I mean, it's coming with a point of view. But they're, they they know that we're weak. We need content. We need stories. So. Yeah, get us that. We need to we need to get some more stories, and that, and so we are weak in that point, and people are taking that kind of thing. And there's unlimited real estate online now. It's not the newspaper margins or just the radio news holes we have to fit. The website and Twitter is it's we've got as much space as we could possibly fill, and people you know could click as much as they want to click all day, all night. One of the things with the polls, there was a post-election story. By, an ex by experts, polling experts, that showed they looked at the 13 major polls going into the election. Twelve of those polls, given the margin of error, would have shown that Trump had a chance to win. So it's not that the polls were that off. That was one, a little misreporting there. The polls weren't that off. Uh, if you take, it did show Hillary winning, but if you take, you guys know what a margin of error, if you, if it's plus or minus 5%, that means it could be 5% the other way, which would have given Trump a chance to win. What happened was the media jumped on board uh, and just said Hillary's going to win. You know, I think that was an error. But uh, Do you fear that the mainstream news is going to be just relegated to policing fake news? That it's just going to take over and your job is just going to be to sort of struggle to say, this isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real? Yeah, I think a big fear is news literacy, and that's um, with the younger generation, and the, all generations really. News literacy is something that um, should be taught and, and respected, and, and it's not taught in schools. You know, it's 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 one of those things that it's not on a written exam. Uh, so that is something that there is a tide that's very heavy that we're constantly working up against, and you know, I I don't have any better radar than other people in the community too I mean I I get duped too so it's it's you see that that is going to be something that's creeping up I think it's something we're up against yeah we were all talking back here in the corner and we and you have to remember we consume a lot of news plus we produce news so we're kind of know what news looks like there's a lot of this news that the and I don't want to I don't want to shift all the blame on readers, but we all share in the blame here from the sender to the news. We're all part of this mix. And there's a good deal of the public that needs to be news literate. And, uh, it, it, you know, I, I wrote down one thing from the, uh, this was, this was mid-October, pre-election. You, you guys know Alex Jones and InfoWars got quite a bit of press. Mm -hmm. That's shocking. Because I was aware of Alex Jones and Infowars two years ago, I never would have thought he would have crawled out of a dark cave. <laughs> and, and if he did, anybody would put a mic in front of him. Mm -hmm. Now he is, and and he wrote he, he had a story that Hillary Hillary was actually a deep. Now I'm not making this up. It's just it's hard to believe. Hillary Clinton is actually a demon. Now from our world, mm -hmm. we're we're in. If we see that, I'm not. I don't want to read anymore. I don't need to read anymore. But 40% of Trump voters read it and believed it. So that's two things. They believed Hillary was a demon. Not only that, they believed there's demons. Mm -hmm. What level 
of consumer is operating here, right? I that's think that's 40% yeah. of Trump voters. I think that's what makes this career a career because I do feel like it is a crusade of sorts to talk about civic engagement. It's not necessarily a glamorous career. With It's got very strange hours. It doesn't have uh, great pay. Um, but it's something I do because um, at a local, for example, Typically, I'm not going to be on the campaign trail with a presidential candidate. I'm going to be uh, on a Tuesday night sitting at city council meeting or covering a, a mayor's race and sitting in a three-hour debate between a race, and three of those candidates aren't going to win. I see it as a use of my time because it will help me understand better uh, the community that I live in, and it will make me want to live in that community. And I believe that that is a worthy cause, even if it's just one, you know, one person or the same 20 people who are in that room every time for a school board or city council or whatever it is. Um, the hope is that people will get fatigued from the fake news or the fabricated news and will want to go back to civil discourse. Yeah. And we're also facing an, an army of PR folks who have a lot of time and, and, and frankly get more money than we do. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people, and I don't blame them, you know, sometimes, you know, they better themselves and they better their economics, but, you know, they put out stuff and, and there's fewer of us foot soldiers, so sometimes you gotta decide what's the best use for our time. Should I spend a little more time investigating this story, backing it up, or do I go to a Marcellus City Council meeting? You know, what's gonna be better for readers? And sometimes investigating what that politician is saying is probably more important than going to the Marcellus City Council or any city council because we've gotta serve readers first and make sure they get the truth. So before we turn it over to the audience for questions, I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to tell us a time that you got a story right and, and why you're proud of getting that story right. I'll, I'll, I'll come, I'll start off with that. Um, my, my proudest story I've ever done and uh, was heard a couple people, just average people in town where I was. I was in New Mexico at the time. I grew up in Illinois, but I spent many years in New Mexico. They told me that they had this big party at this, this school district called this big party, $10,000. Half the money went to a school board member's restaurant. So I, I did a public records request and I said, I want to know about the party at, at the school board member's restaurant. And they said, we have no records to show that this happened, so there's no responsive records. One of the, my sources told me, no, no, the, the party was catered by that restaurant. So they used a little out. There wasn't hell at the restaurant. They knew what party. So I did the request again, and I said, I want quotes from all the restaurants that competed with the school board member. Well, it turns out I got the records when I did the request right, and I called the other restaurants, and I said, did you give a quote for this? No, I said it was a five thousand dollar job. I said, would you remember being uh, given a chance to? Call? You're darn right. That was a, that's a big job for us. So basically, they made up records to make it look like there was an honest uh, competition for the school board member. Plus, they spent ten thousand dollar. I think it ended up being federal funds, federal federal bilingual funds, and uh, you know, ultimately, the a woman, uh, the bilingual director, was a bilingual program. She was uh, you know convicted of of corruption and, and associated with that. We did get that story right, but at the very beginning, people were throwing some pretty harsh accusations, and they even said at one point, um, you know, by doing this, you're being anti-Hispanic, um, by doing these stories, and uh, I was in northern New Mexico at the time, but uh, ultimately, most of the readers, our readers appreciate it, because we expose corruption, but we, we face some pretty harsh letters to the editor. Um, I don't do as much investigative reporting, and so for a story to be right for me, it means that I didn't use my own knowledge or expertise to try to prove or disprove something. I think the perfect story for me is if I go to someone and I say, what should I know about this topic? And then they, they tell me, and then they tell me, you should talk to this person. Then I go to that person. You know, this, this topic, you should talk to this person. Um, I did a story. Obviously, one of the big topics now is, is heroin use and, and drug overdoses. So I was like, how do I tell this story? Oh, my gosh. Well, I started with a coroner. And the coroner was like, you know what, you should talk to this mom. I have interacted with her, so I went to that mom, and she goes, man, you should talk to this person. She's really been through it. And then I went to that, and then by the time I got to the last person, I said, you know, you should talk to the coroner. And I thought, okay. <laughs> that means that uh, that's, it's a full circle thing, and, and that's when it feels like you get the story right. Okay. Yeah, uh, there was a story I did with Kevin Caulfield. Some of you may remember Kevin. He's since passed. I teamed up with him uh, about... Uh, I don't want to say anything. This is a local community boy. I start throwing names out, but it was a project, a prominent project, 
where publicly great things behind the scenes, stiffened contractors and, and contractors were walking away from the project. And a lot of money was, a lot of reputations were on the line. But uh, yeah, I think that there's a lot of stories that I end up being proud of. I think most of it, you know, are, and one of your questions I think got to that, Amanda, and it's the tools, mm -hmm. what tools and resources. And it's when we can use all those tools, like uh, enough time, mm -hmm. never have enough time, enough sources, data and reports are great because they don't have feelings. They're, you don't have to wait till you get them on the line. If you get data or reports, uh, that can reveal what you need. And multiple lines of evidence, you know, not more, you know, more than one source confirming what you're looking for. Mm 